the podcast for the inquisitive diver. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Scuba Goat podcast, where we explore the fascinating world of scuba diving and ocean exploration. Today's guest is a highly accomplished physician and scientist who specializes in diving hyperbaric medicine and anesthesiology. With over 160 published papers and book chapters, he is a recognized authority in his field. A co-author of the fifth edition of Diving and Subaquatic Medicine and the Hyperbaric and Diving Medicine chapter for the last three editions of Harrison's Principles Internal Medicine, Professor Simon Mitchell was honored with the Bank Award by the Undersea and Hyperbaric Medicine Society for his significant contributions to the science of diving and hyperbaric medicine. Simon is a consultant anaesthetist at Auckland City Hospital and a professor in anaesthesiology at the University of Auckland. He provides on-call cover for diving and hyperbaric emergencies at the Hyperbaric Unit in Auckland and he has also assumed the role of editor-in-chief of the Diving and Hyperbaric Medicine Journal in 2019. Aside from his academic and professional achievements, Simon has an impressive diving career with over 6,000 dives spanning sport, scientific, commercial and military diving. Elected to the Fellowship of the Explorers Club of New York in 2006 and recipient of the Dan Rolex Diver of the Year in 2015, Simon's most recent expeditions were Truck in November 2019, the Perse Resurgence Cave in February 2020 and a New Zealand project to take arterial blood gas specimens from an elite freediver at 60 metres in February 21. With his vast experience and expertise in the field of diving and hyperbaric medicine, Professor Simon Mitchell is a truly fascinating guest, and I am delighted to welcome him onto the Scuba Goat podcast. Simon, good morning to you, sir. How are you doing? Yeah, good morning, Matt. Yeah, nice to be here. <laughs> oh, let's uh, let's just turn your volume down a little bit on your end. Uh, I think one of the very first things that we've got to um, kind of look at and chat about is you. Um, so why don't you just let us know where you first started to dive? How did you get into um, donning a mask and fins and, and getting getting wet? I was really lucky, Matt. I grew up in a, a little seaside suburb in Wellington called Seatoon. Wellington in New Zealand has got this amazing rocky coastline where diving can literally be a after work or after school activity. It was after school for me. I was only about 10 or 11 when I started diving and and of course it was snorkeling at first and it was just what the kids did you know we all just got in the water and everything back then had this magical quality about it you know you got in the water and you were just confronted with all these things that you'd never seen before it was just fascinating uh, and you know I just I totally fell in love with it and of course as a boy um, I wanted to catch stuff, uh, so it wasn't long after that that I graduated to spearfishing uh, as a sort of extension of what we were doing. But you know, right back in those days, it was like we couldn't afford wetsuits. We had to wear jerseys. We'd light a fire on the shore, get in the water, freeze, get out of the water, <laughs> heat up around the fire, get back in. Uh, but it was a magical time, you know, and I remember it very clearly. Yeah. Yeah. And at, um, at, at what point did you end up starting to train for the for the diving then? Was that... Yeah, well, it's pretty much as soon as I could. I did an open water diver course. It wasn't paddy in those days. It was the old sort of CMAS uh, system. And I, I think I was 14 when I got my uh, what was called basic scuba, I think, back then. And then... Uh, you know, I, I became an instructor as quickly as you could. I think I was an instructor at the age of 19, and uh, and then it all just progressed from there. I mean, that's one of the amazing things about diving, Matt. And I, you know, I'll make this point probably again is that you can you can make a, a kind of a career. Well, I mean, a recreational career out of it, but reinvent yourself lots of different times. You know, like I say, snorkeling became spearfishing became scuba diving, became instruction, and then combined it with my job. I, my first degree was in marine biology, and I uh, was a, a science technician for our sort of equivalent organization to the CSIRO in Australia or NOAA in the US. Um, so doing marine biology stuff with diving, uh, a bit of photography crept in at that time. Uh, and then after that, I did medicine, went to the military, uh, and was involved with the operational diving team there, did rebreather diving and surface supply diving. Uh, 
and when I left the, the military, it became it morphed into technical diving and photography was back in the frame. So, you know, it's it kind of I've had a lifetime of diving, but it's cycled through different activities. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a hell of a lot to unpack there, mate. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, well, we don't have to unpack all of it. No. But, yeah. So, with, yeah. Did you did, when you um, that, that first step into being an instructor, was that in New Zealand or were you overseas? No, it was different. It, it was in New Zealand, uh, yeah. and uh, again, it was under the old system, the old CMAS system. So it was quite a process, you know. Like it, uh, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with the way it's done these days, where you can progress to being an instructor relatively quickly. Yeah. You know, the safety record of the industry speaks for itself. But uh, back then, it was perceived that you know becoming an instructor was a long and argu arduous thing, and uh, you know it took took a while. Mm. Uh, and then we crossed over into the paddy system later on, about 1985, I think it was. Uh, and you know, I instructed. Uh, diving instruction was how I paid my way through medical school. Okay. Uh, so even then, it was you know diving was an integral part of my life even when I was very distracted with the, you know the rigorous process of doing a medical degree yeah so you did one degree in marine biology and then decided that animals weren't enough for you need to progress onto humans uh yeah well <laughs> well the truth is actually and I you know maybe I'm torpedoing my sort of reputation in medicine here is <laughs> that, that is that when I left school I just simply wasn't good enough to go to med school and in fact it was something I'd always dreamed about but I, there was no way I could have done it on my school record I I was diving too, too much when I should have been <laughs> studying and so I was a very average student at school I like you know we used to have this thing called school school certificate back mm. in the old days which was the first public exam you sat and I actually failed school certificate science and yet here I am you know professor of anesthesiology at the <laughs> medical school I probably shouldn't say that in public but uh, but look it was nothing to do with fundamental ability it was all to do with being obsessed with diving and not not studying like I should have at school. So it wasn't yeah. until I went went and did other things like the marine biology that I started to become a good student and getting the sort of grades that would be necessary for getting into medical school. Mm, mm, mm. So at that, uh, did, did you have any any kind of idea at, at that time in your life that, that the two should meet, you know, that with the medical training and the, and the diving? Did, did you see that at an early stage? Uh, sort of, yeah. I mean, when I, once I got into medical school, then it did crystallize in my head that I, when I left there, when I got through the course, I would like in some way to try to adapt my career to diving. And uh, that was, it was in those years that I first encountered this guy called Des Gorman, who actually is quite well known in medical circles here in New Zealand um, and was in, Aus uh, in Australia too. He, he was a prominent diving physician at that time, head of the unit in Adelaide, the Hyperbaric Medicine Unit Royal Adelaide Hospital, had a massive reputation and I got in touch with him and uh, he encouraged me to think about diving medicine as a career and in fact serendipitously he moved from Australia to New Zealand to the Royal New Zealand Navy about the time I graduated from medical school so it was a natural thing to go from med school to working with Des in the Royal New Zealand Navy um, and that was a terrific time I mean it was the early 90s and we had this exuberant diving population here in New Zealand who we you know weren't particularly good at following the rules and we had a, a, a large number of decompression sickness cases so it was a fantastic time for getting true experience-based expertise in diving medicine and so I worked, I worked in the Navy with DES for uh, about eight or nine years oh, uh, which was a fantastic grounding in diving medicine and it was later that I moved into anesthesiology uh, after I left the Navy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you were actually enlisted. Uh, I assume commissioned, being a, a you know a doctor. Yes, I was. Yeah, I was a, a commissioned officer in the Royal New Zealand Navy, and and look, I you know I, that was a fabulous time of my life. I I embraced the naval life. I I had a lot of deployments overseas on ships. I had some wonderful experiences and. 
saw some things and did some things I never would have done if I wasn't in the Navy. There's no question about that. Mm. Uh, the problem with the New Zealand Navy and my ambitions is that the New Zealand Navy is just a bit small to train you in the specialist fields that you wanted to go into. Mm. You know, whereas in the United States, they will train, and the UK, even Australia, they'll tra tra train their doctors in specialties like anesthesia, surgery, everything pretty much. Mm. Um, the New Zealand Navy doesn't do that. And in order to become an anaesthetist, I needed to leave the Navy. So that's mm. what I ended up doing. Yeah, it's a shame because um, obviously they, they they lose a lot of people doing it that way. But um, they do. You know, you've got to follow your goals, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons the New Zealand Navy, I think, is under kind of understaffed from a medical point of view because there's no... It's difficult to have a medical career unless you want to do it in a an area that's specifically aligned with Navy interests. And basically, mm. they would train you in general practice or occupational medicine, um, but not, uh, but unfortunately, not the sort of sharpened specialty that I wanted to go into anesthesia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember looking at um, the New Zealand uh, New Zealand uh, military probably late 90s, early 2000s, because I was in the UK military and I was considering jumping ship over to Australia, New Zealand. But, um, but even as a, a you know, a, I think you call them blackhander over here, whether they're the same down in New Zealand, uh, proportions engineer, it was never high on the list. It was always the GPs and the dentists that they wanted though. So I was just in the wrong trade. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yes. Well, look, I, no, I don't, I don't wish in any way, shape or form to uh, sound like I'm disparaging my time in the Navy. I, I'm not at all. And indeed, it was what got me started. And, uh, you know, Des was a, a high level academic who supervised my PhD. They, they, they actually allowed me the time to do a PhD while I was in the Navy. And that's mm. what got me started my academic career, my research interest in diving medicine. Uh, and all that clinical experience with sick divers. Uh, you know, in 1995, we treated 100 cases of decompression sickness, which, <laughs> you know, which is a lot. You know, yeah. I remember pretty much living at the hyperbaric unit in January. We treated 30 of those cases in January that year. And, you know, all the years around then, mid-90s, it was a bit like that, not quite 100, but up there. Uh, so it, it, as a, a young doctor trying to get genuine experience-based expertise, it was terrific. And it's hard now, you know, like the numbers of decompression sickness cases have fallen off substantially, certainly mm. the number that we treat. And uh, and now someone coming into the field like me would really struggle to find the experience they need to call themselves a, you know, a genuine experienced diving physician. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And, and just to put that into context, context there, I was talking to a, a good friend of mine um, who's based on Koh Tao in Thailand, mm -hmm. and she is the uh, manager of the hyperbaric chamber that they put in there recently. And that little island is is one of the busiest locations on earth for new for divers divers wanting to do uh, recreational diving and get into it. And I think last month they only had two suspected cases where they put put them in the pot just to make sure. Mm. Um, so to hear, what was it, 30 cases in one month? Um, you guys down there were really going for it. We were, but, uh, you know, it needs to be said that that has changed, uh, mm. you know, and it's not that way anymore. Like we, now we would be lucky to treat 20 cases in a year. Uh, wow. So, so it's really gone down and uh, there's all sorts of reasons for that, but... Uh, which we can talk about later if you want, but <clears throat> there are still some places in Asia, in fact, uh, where they are treating large numbers of cases, but not usually recreational divers. They're usually uh, indigenous sea harvesters. There's a few spots uh, in Asia and China where people who are doing you know, fishing mm -hmm. uh, at a sort of occupational level are getting sick quite often. So, so there are still some places in the world where they treat a lot of divers, but we're not one of them anymore. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good to hear. Not, <clears throat> not too good, like you say, for people coming into the industry, but it's, it's good to hear that people are being safe. Um, I suppose... Over the years that you've been doing this, you've you've obviously seen a, a massive change in um, the understanding of um, you know, the pressure on the body uh, as divers. Uh, 
we do get many people come listening to the show that are relatively new to diving. So would you mind just giving us a, a, a background or a, a quick overview of the basics of, of what decompression sickness, decompression illness is? Sure. Um, well, decompression illness, and it's often not appreciated fully, is a collective term for two different disorders. One is decompression sickness, which creates some confusion because illness and sickness sound very similar. And the second problem that exists under that umbrella of decompression illness is what we call arterial gas embolism. And that's probably the quickest one to explain, so I'll deal with that first. So divers will all be familiar with the fact that they've been taught to you know, breathe normally, never hold their breath. And that's because if you hold your breath and ascend, then expanding gas can damage the lungs and introduce bubbles into the bloodstream, the arterial blood, and that's what called arterial gas embolism and those bubbles can travel to all places in the body but the place we worry the most about is the brain because they can produce stroke-like symptoms uh, which can be serious or even fatal uh, so that's arterial gas embolism and uh, it's actually relatively rare you know just we talk about it a lot particularly in diver training courses to try and prevent it appropriately but uh, it's actually not very common the second problem, decompression sickness, it's kind of completely different. Even though it involves bubbles, just the same as arterial gas embolism, it's a, it's a very different mechanism. So that's the one where when we dive, we're breathing compressed gas for a period of time. We absorb some of the inert gas. So if, it, if it's an air dive, that's nitrogen. And then as we come back to the surface decompress, that gas wants to come out of solution and what we want it to do is diffuse from tissues into the blood and be carried back to the lungs and be breathed out. But what it can do is actually form bubbles, especially if we come up too quickly or don't do an appropriate amount of decompression. Um, although it must be said that we, most of us do actually form bubbles even on dives where there's nothing gone wrong and where we don't get any symptoms. And those bubbles seem to be relatively harmless. But if there's enough of them or if they're in the wrong place, then they can cause harm. So those little nitrogen bubbles, they can form in tissues. Um, and classically, we talk about the bends because that's a manifestation of pain. Uh, bubbles forming in the pain sensitive structures in our musculoskeletal system. But the bubbles can get into the blood uh, and that they can, again, they can travel around the body and cause various symptoms. Of course, we worry the most about neurological problems like spinal cord involvement or the brain or the inner ear, which can produce quite dramatic and quite serious symptoms. Mm. But that that is a very different problem to arterial gas embolism. Like that lung damage and arterial gas embolism can occur in incredibly shallow water. Like you can do that in a swimming pool if you get it wrong. So even you know, like a meter deep, whereas it's impossible to get decompression sickness in that sense. Setting, whereas decompression sickness requires that you go deeper and longer and the deeper and longer you go the, the higher the risk obviously um, so yeah that's I mean that's a quick walk through decompression sickness and uh, arterial gas embolism collectively referred to as decompression illness is that what you were kind of getting at is that the sort of overview you wanted it's perfect perfect yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. It's, it is a, a very confusing subject for um, for most people, especially, I mean, even for uh, experienced divers, you know, it's, it's good to refresh on these matters. Um, yeah. So, um, obviously, when we go diving, we've got the RSTC medical forms and asking about pre-existing -me pre medical conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Are there, um, are there key elements that you've seen over the years that, that may... Um, amplify the, the 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 chances of being affected by decompression sickness uh well there are some medical predispositions to that uh but mostly those are not really things that you would typically pick up in a in a routine diving medical so um i speak specifically of a thing called um, patent frame and ovale which is a little communication between the two upper chambers of the heart which we all have when we're in our mother's wombs because it by it allows blood to bypass the lungs which you don't need when you're when you're not born yet mm. um, 
but in some people that persists after birth it, in other words it doesn't close like it's supposed to and that allows blood from the veins that have quite a few that has quite a few nitrogen bubbles in it to get across into the arterial side normally those bubbles would be filtered by the lungs and removed and they don't get onto the arterial side of our circulation but if they can do that across a patent frame and ovale then uh, that is a predisposition to certain forms of decompression sickness including the more serious forms now mm. we can't pick that up in a routine diving medical and we usually only discover it after people do suffer those relevant forms of decompression sickness and we do a test for it um, but it's probably worth pointing out, which since you've raised the issue of, of diving medicals and the RSTC form and the history we take there, that the most important element of that is not predispositions to decompression sickness, but more your general health. Uh, and it's blokes like you and me, actually, Matt, that uh, it's targeted most at, because of all the diving fatalities, about a third of them are due to some kind of cardiac event as a as a predisposing injury as it were you know so in other words someone has a heart attack in the water and ends up drowning yeah. uh, and and so the diving medical is more focused on excluding those kind of problems than it is the underlying uh, predispositions for decompression sickness mm -hmm. and I, and actually one of the weaknesses in our system one of the big weaknesses is that you and I can have a diving medical at the start of our career, or in fact, maybe not even have a, a medical. You know, you fill out the RSTC form, it's a screening questionnaire, and there's nothing wrong with it. It works well, and I, I say that because I help design it. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, if there's no positive answers on the screening questionnaire, then you go into your diving course and you do your diving course. And from that point on, it's possible to have an entire diving career and never interface with the medical system again, unless you do another course or you're required to have a diving medical for some specific reason. But we're not very good at health surveillance. In other words, keeping an eye on our health over the years as we get older. I mean, I started diving with them when I was 14. That's, I have to, I'm going to admit on, on air, but that's 50 years ago, right? So, yeah, yeah. so I, you know, I could have gone that entire time with no interface with the medical system. Mm. As it happens, I go to a GP regularly. I have checkups uh, because I've seen too many friends get into trouble with cardiac issues over the years that are undetected. So those are the things that the diving medical tends to focus on or the medical mm. screening focuses on rather than the trying to identify underlying causes of decompression sickness. Yeah, which is why you've got that uh, tick box for anyone over 45 that, that picks on me straight away. Absolutely right. You right. know, anyone who's over 45 should actually, if, yeah, the, the, the form's quite sensible. Like, mm. you should see a doctor, but if you walk into a doctor's surgery and can give a convincing history of superb functional capacity, like, Matt, I'm Matt Waters, <clears throat> I go, I run a marathon once a week. I don't get any chest pain and you know like that would probably tell me that i don't need to do any more investigations on you but mm. if you're you know overweight unfit have a family history of of cardiac problems and you're a smoker then i would probably think very strongly about investigating you for cardiac issues further mm. so mm. it's it's getting people at that risk age into the system so that they don't miss something that's important and could result in their death in a in a diving environment yeah 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 hey one thing i'd like to pick up on actually you just mentioned their smokers um i'm an ex-smoker um so i'm now mr anti-smoker and and hate it i can smell it a thousand meters away but um is it is there a mass? Have you seen uh, or got any kind of evidence of of smoking being a major um, addition to issues when diving? Yeah. Look, the truth is, uh, no, we don't have strong evidence that smoking is a risk factor for uh, specifically for the things that I've been talking about. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, there's 
there's a massive evidence that smoking is a risk factor for heart disease mm. and heart disease has been proven hard evidence this is not speculation to be the disabling injury in 30 percent of diving fatalities so right there you've got a really good reason not to smoke if you're a diver yeah. <clears throat> however it's also almost certainly true that smoking predisposes you to lung conditions that might make pulmonary barotrauma more likely but we have no real proof of that mm, mm, mm. i find it quite interesting because obviously being an ex-smoker and I, I took that leap i was a smoker for 30 34 35 years um and then when i gave up i couldn't believe how much better my lifestyle got and yeah. in particular in the water Oh, look, you know, diving aside, uh, you know, in my role as a physician, <laughs> I would say to anyone watching this that if you're a smoker, the single most important step you can ever take uh, to improve your general state of health is to give up smoking. Yeah. And it will improve your financial situation. Uh, there's oh. all sorts of benefits as well. Yeah. But, uh, you know, smoking, I mean, I, I, I would say, Matt, that in some point in the future, people will look back on the age of smoking and go did they really do that like I know. that's just crazy <laughs> but i think people will i i think that that some point in the future people will look back on that like like we look back on how they used to send kids up chimneys to clean them out or you know and they'll go no way like like puffing smoke into your lungs you've got to be joking yeah. anyway yeah that prom rant over no, it's okay. I, I I keep ranting with my son about it because he's um, he does like part time cigarettes, but he's on vapes all the time, and it's just it's in his mouth twenty four seven. It's ridiculous, mm. uh, and God knows what he's doing because you know there's no studies or no proof for uh, what's going on with those things at the moment. But it's just all chemicals. It's just crazy. Yeah, no, not a good. Thing. <laughs> I'll have my little rant on it as well. So, Marcus, <laughs> if you're listening, stop vaping. <laughs> um. Oh, hey, um, one thing I, I wanted to ask or highlight as well is um, the advantages of, of being underwater for um, people that are disabled and, and, and special needs, because I've been doing a fair bit of helping out with Lindy Leggett from the scuba gym, and mm. um, I think she's doing a, a, an absolutely outstanding job. But um, it led me to think with this chat coming up with you is is you know about the the larger roles of hyperbaric oxygen therapy um can, can you talk about that at all on on how it's used outside of diving as well and the benefits yeah of course i can brings? uh yeah look first of all let me just comment uh, pick up on your comment about the special needs divers uh i you know that has been con controversial over the years uh, mm. but I, i'm i as you know as a physician and uh you know the sort of one of the so-called gatekeepers in terms of fitness for diving I, I think a certain amount of cautious caution is necessary when you're selecting people to do those kind of programs you just need to make sure they don't have any major problems that would be associated with increased risk underwater but I am 100% supportive of those programs. They do a fantastic job uh, for properly selected participants. And uh, and in fact, there's published evidence now, you know, a number of publications in the journal that I'm editor of, of the psychological and physical benefits of participating in those kind of programs. So I, I am very, uh, I'm very supportive of that. Uh, but yeah, jumping to hyperbaric oxygen. So yeah, as you've quite rightly pointed out, uh, you know, recompression and breathing 100% oxygen has been the gold standard therapy for treating decompression sickness for fairly obvious reasons. You know, you compress bubbles and you get rid of nitrogen more quickly if you compress someone and breathe oxygen. Uh, and uh, perhaps not so obvious mechanisms, but hyperbaric oxygen has some biochemical effects which are advantageous in treating bubble induced injury. So, um, you know, that and that's obvious to any diver, they, they know about that literally from day one that, you know, decompression sickness or arterial gas embolism, you get recompressed. But hyperbaric oxygen, so the administration of oxygen under pressure, is also used, as you quite rightly point out, as a treatment in certain medical problems. Uh, and 
there are a relatively small number of those problems which ha where the use of hyperbaric oxygen has been supported by good data uh, but you know the most prominent ones that we would use hyperbaric oxygen for say in Australia or New Zealand would be non-healing wounds uh, it, particularly in diabetics and particularly in the lower limbs um, radiation tissue injury so it's not a well-known fact that when people have radiotherapy for cancer they can develop tissue injury which can last a very long time and indeed can get worse over time uh, and produce quite disabling symptoms depending on where it is uh, and hyperbaric oxygen is pretty much the only thing that uh, encourages that tissue to develop new blood vessels and heal so just those two things alone are quite prominent indications for hyperbaric oxygen there's about 10 or 12 others that are also on the list of things that we would consider established by sufficient data to justify the use the biggest problem with it is that hyperbaric oxygen is relatively easy to administer you don't actually have to be a doctor to do it uh, and it's it's been abused all over the world for the treatment of just about anything uh, and you know typically by people who will take money off you for putting you in a chamber and giving you what I would call false hope yeah. uh, and it's a major problem in the field and I have written with one or two of my colleagues I've written extensively about this uh, because it's a real blight on the field and one of the problems with it that's sometimes not recognized is that all of my non hyperbaric colleagues out there in the wider world look at that you know so they'll see a list of a hundred things that someone says they can treat in a hyperbaric chamber and they just look at that and they go that's just quackery which it is mm -hmm. of course but they form a judgment about the entire field based on seeing those kind of things and so it drags the whole show down so the patients that really would benefit from it like the diabetic ulcers the radiation tissue injury patients don't get referred because the doctors looking after them think that the whole field is full of quacks and it, you know it's it's not something that they would subject their patients to and that's tragic mm. because it does work for certain things but there's an awful lot of misinformation and of course you know the internet's the worst thing for that you know like you'll find no shortage of people who are trumpeting the benefits of hyperbaric oxygen for all sorts of things typically things that have some kind of cognitive psychological overlay because you think about it matt if you were to design the best placebo intervention in the world it would be a hyperbaric chamber right you yeah. you come there once a day massive commitment and expectation you're greeted by all these staff who are lovely to you and and you meet other people which might not be the case for a lot of you know patients they they have these social interactions which might not be normal for them they go into this chamber that is sort of quite adventurous and it's it heats up on compression and it and it cools down during decompression and they breathe oxygen in there and this whole you know milieu of stimulation is a potent placebo if you are suffering from a problem that has any kind of cognitive overlay to it so you know it's no wonder that people who have for example chronic neurological disorders like chronic fatigue or or multiple sclerosis that fluctuates a bit or um you know well any number of things mm. it's no wonder that when they go into a hyperbaric chamber and and have a course of treatment that they believe that it's actually helping them yeah. and in fact there's been multiple studies looking at this now in various indications like chronic brain injury from trauma where uh the placebo the the uh, you know where they basically they give two they have two groups they give one of them real hyperbaric oxygen and another a sham hyperbaric oxygen treatment in other words it's the same experience just without the hyperbaric oxygen and both yeah. groups benefit both groups say they got better but there's no difference between the groups so um, anyway that I don't want to go on about that for too long but 
that is one of the problems in the field with hyperbaric oxygen that it gets abused by people who take money off patients for a treatment with no real proof that it actually is beneficial. So, I mean, this is the first I've heard of this. These are private companies that are linked into the medical care structure and, and get referred to. And do, does the, does the um, you know, Medicare or the, the government assist in funding this stuff? Or is it completely on the backing of the, the patient to do it of their own accord? Yeah, typically the latter. Uh, so in Australia, there are there are units, there are publicly funded units or units that can bill Medicare for certain indications, but they only will pay for the things that it actually does work for. So mostly uh, it's, it's patients paying for it themselves, which is another thing that really offends me. You know, you're taking money off these people who can't afford it, uh, mm. you know, for a treatment that doesn't work. I mean, there's just, for a physician, there's nothing worse, in my opinion. I, I mean, I just think that that's terrible. Mate, I've literally just opened, the, I've just punched into Google hyperbaric chamber. And the very first page that I've opened, it's, it's very first sentence is, our pressurized hyperbaric chamber is a non-medical wellness device. Yeah, well, uh, you'll probably yeah. find that that, advertisement is for what they call mild hyperbaric treatment or a chamber that doesn't pressurize you to very high pressures and you may even just breathe air in it and they'll be touting <laughs> it you know like it, it would be just the same as putting a, a plastic oxygen mask on sitting in the corner of your living room yeah. in terms of the oxygen dose and yet they'll sell you that or put you in one of those and charge you money for it uh, claiming that it works for all sorts of medical problems, but um, yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm actually, yeah, I'm going to stop looking at that page. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I would. Uh, well, you might be signing up for it, of course. <laughs> mate, you've just, uh, yeah, I think you've just opened a big bag of worms. I'm not going to be able to get yeah. That's, that's no, a well, I, <laughs> look, I don't, you know, I, I mean, I don't think we should spend too much time talking about hyperbaric treatment, no. but except to say that it is a thing and it works for certain diseases and and diving illnesses, uh, you know, decompression sickness and arterial gas embolism is one of uh, two of them. Mm. Uh, and then there's a limited range of other things. Um, but there's an awful lot of bollocks out there on the internet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. I've literally just seen it. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, let's move away from uh, the, the the bollocks and the the quacks. <laughs> um, now, one thing I do remember from my years instructing all the time, when you talk about um, DCS, DCIs, the quantity of symptoms or the range of symptoms is just truly astounding. Um, are there, can you narrow it down a little bit for, you know, maybe people that might be quite nervous of, do I have the bends? Uh, is there obvious symptoms that would, would stand out? Yeah, it's real. that's an interesting question. Uh, it is difficult to narrow down because the truth is that decompression sickness, so we're talking about the consequences of bubbles forming from dissolved gas coming out of solution. Hmm. Um, it does have a very wide range of symptoms. And one of the problems is that those symptoms are what we would refer to as non-specific. In other words, they can be symptoms of lots of other things, uh, which makes it very confusing to make a diagnosis. Uh, mm. And one of the biggest challenges in diving medicine is getting a call from someone who's in a remote location. They might even be on a liveaboard dive boat where evacuating them would be a massive challenge and of course ruin the trip for everyone else on the boat etc and mm. they've got these non-specific symptoms that are quite hard to sort out anyway that wasn't really your question but the the point is that the symptoms are varied and um they uh, you know they can be quite difficult to separate from other things however uh the most common symptoms are things like musculoskeletal pain. And I would say this, that, uh, you know, pain can arise from a whole lot of things, but the pain of decompression sickness is quite distinctive. A lot, I've actually had musculoskeletal decompression sickness twice, uh, and it's like this deep, boring ache that is a bit unlike, you know, the pain you get when you strain a muscle or, 
for a start movement doesn't usually make it worse and rubbing it doesn't make it better and it's like it's like you can't do anything about it both the times i've had it was in my upper arm not so much my shoulder but uh because mm. people talk about pain in the joints but and i think this pain can kind of happen in lots of different places but the most common places are upper arm shoulders hips knees so in association probably with the pain sensitive structures around those major joints mm. So pain. Um, and then uh, another common problem is a rash, which uh, can take multiple forms. It can look like a sort of allergic rash, and then uh, it can also present as a sort of a much more bruised looking appearance, quite a scary looking rash. Um, we call that uh, cutis marmorata, and it's fairly distinctive when you see it. So pain, a rash. Uh, other common problems, uh, the, well, the most, co those are the common mild symptoms and then there the probably the most common serious symptom uh, uh, weakness or numbness in the limbs particularly the lower limbs that would suggest that you've got spinal involvement okay uh, and and that's probably the that's the most feared symptom of decompression sickness that occurs moderately often it's still compared to the pain and rash symptoms it's actually quite uncommon uh, and then you can get other symptoms like very significant dizziness or what we call vertigo hearing loss after a dive that and that's because the bubbles are involving the inner ear uh, and there's a whole variety of other things. I mean, I, I think walking all th walking right through all of the symptoms of decompression sickness, we, we could spend a lot of time doing that. And mm. I, I just, I would, I'd endorse your point that it, it's a disease with a, a wide variety of symptoms, many of which can be caused by other problems. And I think the thing, the thing I would say to divers is, look, when when you get symptoms after diving, then there's a good chance that they're diving related, right? Unless it's some kind of bizarre coincidence. So what I would, especially with the more serious symptoms, it's important that you don't rationalize and say, okay, um, I've got this symptom, but I'm going to try and attribute it to something else because I don't want the stigma or uh, the blame for getting decompression sickness mm. and I actually that's a very good and important point to make is that you know when we got into diving especially in the older days there was this thing that if you get decompression sickness then you must have done something wrong and um, and now we have a much more sophisticated understanding of that it's not true people especially in the the more advanced forms of diving like technical diving where they're doing decompressions you know, these decompressions are just sort of estimates of what what puts your safety level at an acceptable level. They're not absolutes. They're not binary outcomes. So it's, if you do your decompression, you definitely won't get sick. And if you don't do it, you definitely will. It's not yeah. like that. It you You can do everything right and still get symptoms. And you can do everything wrong and not get symptoms. So don't rationalize. Just if you've got symptoms, especially the more significant ones after diving, you should contact the diving emergency service, whatever it is in whatever country you're in, and and talk to an expert. That's why those those services are available 24 hours. Yeah. yeah. And divers have this tendency to do this. You know, especially guys, they don't like to get that diagnosis, and uh, and so they'll you know they get to the surface and they are really dizzy and vomiting and they'll say oh no i'm seasick and and i'll yeah. go and lie down for you know a couple of hours and when they finish lying down then they find they can't move their legs also you know like it, these are the things that can catch people out yeah yeah um quick break mate i need to pee okay oh that's better <laughs> <laughs> this is a morning recording last time i did a recording it was with pete mesley so it was beers and wine and uh, uh, i think we were stopping every 20 minutes at that one <laughs> i have um talked about that just picking up on what we were saying there i've got a, a good buddy of mine and i won't i won't name him uh, but he's a, a a dive professional and years ago we were diving together and um we come back up to the surface and just a standard recreational no decompression <clears throat> and um is, that, is, is this cotton? Do you get this as well? And his skin, you could literally feel it like um, 
like the uh, the popping wrapping bubble wrap. I'm like, dude, that's that's really not right. You need to get that checked out. And on return to his home country, he brought it up with his doctor, who then sent him on to um, a research team. And he ended up doing, I think, two, three, four dives or something like that in a controlled environment with them to find out why he was getting, um, I think it was a subcutaneous hematoma, um, if that's right. Yeah. Um, but there was no... Um, there was no result. There was they, they couldn't understand why he was getting this, and they checked him for PFO and all that kind of stuff. And and he's an absolutely fantastic diver, perfect trim, perfect profile, everything. Um, and he's just, I think, it's fair to say that he's a bit of a freak of nature. Uh, there's just been no no understanding of why it occurs with him, but it's literally every dive he does. That's really interesting. Uh, he may mm. actually have contacted me, I think, uh, to ask about that. I, I have had a couple of people raise those kind of things with me. I mean, if you're asking me why, I mean, I you know, given that he's been extensively investigated and no no issues found, I, I may be in no better position than, well, I certainly am not mm. in a better position than the people who've investigated him to speculate on that. But um, mm. subcutaneous emphysema, particularly uh, if you find it up around the base of the neck um, in that skin, in, in this sort of area or up in the neck itself, that can indicate uh, that you've got some kind of leakage of gas out of the lungs that's getting into the sort of central chest area and migrating up into the the tissues around here and and in fact um that that's really the only circumstance under which i've ever felt what you you know like the bubble wrap uh, mm. and it's, it's vanishingly rare i mean you, you almost mm. never see it um but why you would get that i mean why, where was the skin where you could feel it where, which on his, on his on his forearm. On his forearm. Oh, yeah. Well, that that's yeah. very unusual. I mean, it, certainly mm. what I was just discussing wouldn't cause that. So that mm. suggests that he's getting bubble formation in his skin. Mm. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, that's a very unusual presentation, and probably is explained in some way by some kind of strange circulatory problem that you know like he's he's loading gas during the dive and then getting vasoconstriction which stops the gas washing out of the tissues which could conceivably form gas you know under the skin so that you could feel it uh, but mm. i've never seen that i have heard of it but i've never seen it in a very long diving medicine career i've never actually seen that i've certainly yeah. felt bubbles under the skin around the base of the neck from pulmonary barotrauma <clears throat> but i've never seen that uh, so yeah. on, on the on the back, on the backing of what you've just said there, and and with your superior experience and knowledge in this, I, I'm going to confirm that I can still call him a freak of nature. <laughs> yes, well, I think <laughs> that's fair. Yep, that's definitely fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, moving on a little bit, um, and we you mentioned age earlier on, arterial gas. Um, what? Well, how, how is that? It, are the, are the um, symptoms significantly different, and um, what are the kind of long-term consequences of possible of arterial of, gas of embolism? Oh, and, look, uh, it, it's in many respects a bit like a stroke. So, you know, the bubbles will go into the cerebral circulation, so the brain, and they block. If they're big enough, they'll block blood vessels, which produces things like you see in a stroke so it can produce unconsciousness it can produce uh, a hemiplegia so a, a paralysis down one side of the body either upper limb lower limb or both it can produce visual changes uh, or loss of vision uh, speech difficulties thinking difficulties anything that can happen in a stroke now the thing that separates arterial gas embolism from a typical stroke is that a stroke is caused by a clot or something solid and unless you get that clot removed pretty quickly, uh, you will likely end up with some kind of permanent effect from your stroke. <clears throat> Bubbles are a little bit different in that they actually can redistribute and not block the blood vessel. 
However, if they're big enough and they block it for long enough, just like a stroke, you can get permanent paralysis, hemiplegias, you can get permanent visual loss, permanent cognitive function changes, permanent speech changes. But, but the spectrum of long-term effects goes right through to complete recovery. And indeed, it's not that uncommon for a diver to come to the surface uh, like a ra you know the classic situation is a rapid ascent where people forget to breathe or forget to breathe normally or hold their breath they go rapidly unconscious wake up and they're confused and then everything goes away and that certainly happens so full recovery spontaneously without even without any treatment is certainly mm. possible but at the other end of the spectrum permanent disability or even death is certainly possible as well so it's a very yeah, okay. variable thing. And that probably mm. depends very much on the size of the bubbles, the gas load that gets introduced into the circulation. Mm. Mm. And um, presumably um, when we're looking at a dive profile, if, if the diver is working excessively, then um, that must uh, increase the chances of, of getting uh, symptoms of, of either. Um, well, working, DCI, DCI. yes, that's right. so decompression sickness where you absorb nitrogen and then it comes out of solution as you come back to the surface. There's a whole mm. bunch of things about a dive profile that we look at in trying to make a judgment about how likely decompression sickness is after the dive. Now, sometimes it's obvious that we're dealing with decompression sickness, but then other times when the symptoms are more subtle or non-specific, like, like I said before, can be caused by other things. Sometimes we then focus a lot on the dive profile and what happened on the dive in assessing the risk so that it gives us, it gives us a mental picture or, or a, a yardstick against which to judge the the risk of the dive. So things like the profile itself is obviously critically important. So the deeper, the longer, if you come up too quickly or you miss decompression stops, then obviously those are all factors that point us towards a higher risk. Uh, but then you just mentioned, you know, working. If you work hard, I mean, you think about a typical dive, right? You work hard or at least you're working when you're swimming around the bottom, but during the ascent, particularly on a decompression dive, where you're just kind of hanging out in the water, you're not working. And, mm. and when you're working on the bottom, you've got lots of circulation because your heart's pumping more, the blood's flowing more, so you take up gas more quickly. But when you're resting on the decompression that's the kind of the opposite so your heart's not pumping as much your blood's not circulating as fast and so washing that gas that you've absorbed out of the tissues is actually a slower process so that asymmetry in working between the bottom phase of the dive and the surfacing phase is a risk factor and another mm. classic example of that is temperature, right? So you think about a typical dive. You jump in the water, you're warm at the start of the dive. You're swimming around, you're warm. That's when you're absorbing the gas down at the bottom. But then during the decompression, when you're not moving so much and it's, you know, time's dragging on, that's when you get cold. And when you get cold, you get blood vessel constriction. That's exactly how your body defends against heat loss. So you get all this peripheral vasoconstriction so that your circulation through your tissues during the decompression isn't as good. Again, mm. a proven risk factor for decompression sickness. And let me say that, you know, this is not just theory. The, the, the risk associated with increased work at depth and getting cold during decompression is well proven by hard data. And then there's, you know, there's a few other things that people talk about, like, you know, being dehydrated and, um, being fatter, uh, you know, with a higher percentage of body fat and a few other things where the data are less convincing. But, you know, certainly it's one of the things we look at, Matt, is, you know, when someone contacts us, we are very interested in the diving they've done and the profile that they used and the circumstances of the dive. You know, was it warm? Was it cold? Was there hard work? Was there not? You know, all those things are things we factor into assessing the risk of the dive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's one hell of a rabbit hole to go down, isn't it? Oh, it is. It, it is. And, and it brings me right back to some of the comments I made earlier about experience-based expertise. It, it's really challenging for a, a, a practitioner who hasn't 
isn't a diver themselves perhaps and hasn't dealt with a lot of divers and hasn't seen enough cases to develop that pattern recognition that we rely on quite a lot in medicine it's very challenging for them to confront a diver on the phone and uh, well confront's the wrong word but you know like speak to a diver on the phone and and assess all these things that I'm talking about uh, and wrap it all up into a final decision about what to do with that person on the end of the phone. It is, it's very challenging. Mm. I suppose one of the difficulties, like you mentioned earlier on as well, is um, especially with with men, will be that uh, that bruised ego and just washing over. You know, if you're trying to get it from conversation on a phone, um, you're not getting that visual um, indicators of a bit of bullshit going on to try and, Oh no, for sure, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, and I, look, I'm always a little bit wary about uh, about what I hear on the phone. So, I, I, you know, any dive, any experienced diving physician will tell you that they'll have seen lots of cases where what you get told on the phone and what you see when the diver ends up with you are two very different things. And often mm -hmm. they're a lot worse than what they implied they were on the phone. So. The phone conversations, if I get any sense that I'm dealing with something that could be serious, I'll usually opt for a relatively conservative stance and evacuate the diver. Um, now there are there are exceptions. We don't we certainly don't evacuate everyone we have a conversation with, and indeed uh, that's one of the reasons we're treating less cases these days because we recognize we've defined, a, we've made a definition of mild decompression sickness and we have an international consensus that says if the diver really does only have very mild symptoms then it's okay to manage them without evacuating them and recompressing them. That of course doesn't mean I wouldn't recompress someone like that you know if they were standing if they were here in Auckland of, of course I would but if they're on Bikini Atoll and it's going to take a $200,000 slightly hazardous evacuation to evacuate someone who's got a bit of mild elbow pain and nothing else, then I would probably manage that person at Bikini Atoll rather than try and evacuate them. So these days we do make judgments on this, but if I, getting back to my point, if I was nervous about what the person was telling me and I got any hint that they might be obfuscating more serious symptoms, I usually opt for an evacuation. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, well, speaking about the evacuation, um, you know, once you've decided that you're going to evacuate someone and and use the pot, as it were, um, how do you go through the process of determining the appropriate um, treatment plan for that patient? Do you mean in terms of the evacuation or what we do with them when they get to the hyperbaric chamber? Yeah, when, when you get back to... Yeah. Putting them inside. Well, look, the truth of it is it's a fairly generic process. Uh, we, you know, we have one... Uh, we have well there's several options for the recompression profile but there's one very generic option called the US Navy table 6 which is a four and a four and three quarter hour recompression that involves compressing them to 2.8 atmospheres or 18 meters of seawater equivalent for three 20 minute oxygen breathing periods and then decompressing over 30 minutes to nine meters seawater equivalent or 1.9 atmospheres and there's a couple of one hour periods of oxygen breathing there separated by an air break and then a final decompression to the to surface pressure now that can be modified a little bit you can extend the period of time you spend at both of those pressures uh, but look if all you ever did uh, you know, no matter who you are, anywhere in the world, treating decompression sickness or arterial gas embolism, if all you ever did was the US Navy Table 6, then you couldn't really be criticised for that because there's no real evidence that anything else is any better. Uh, but yeah. some places, and we've been, we've indulged in this kind of thing over the years, we, we sometimes recompress to a slightly deeper depth. If we get someone very early with very serious symptoms, we'll sometimes do that. Sometimes use different gases, especially when you go beyond 2.8 atmospheres or 18 metres of seawater equivalent in a chamber, can't use 100% oxygen anymore because it becomes too toxic. So you have to breathe something else and we'd rather they didn't breathe air. So often we'll use heliox mixtures for those kind of recompressions 
but that's mm -hmm. getting quite heroic and there's no real evidence that it's any better than just doing that standard US Navy Table 6, maybe making it a little bit longer if they've got very serious symptoms. So there's not a lot of variability in that. That's the truth of it. Mm. It's, mm. you know, it's not the most complicated intervention in medicine, one would have to say. <laughs> so, um, um, well, is, is there any, um, is there any cases that stand out to mind that you, that you, you that you can discuss um, that have maybe piqued your uh, your interest or challenges well the the interesting cases are the ones that are you know like somewhat paradoxically in terms of outcome for the diver the most interesting cases are the sickest ones uh, because they're challenging and they're interesting you know I, I hasten to add that one would prefer they didn't happen to the diver but when they do those are the ones that are interesting and one of the one of the fascinating things about diving in the last sort of 20 years we've had this you know advent of technical diving and uh, because these divers are doing deep dives you know and I'm I'm, I'm obviously one of them right so in mm. no way shape or form is this any sort of criticism you know I do it uh, but we so i might as well use the term we we do these deep dives that require decompression often quite substantial amounts of decompression and of course that introduces the potential for things to go wrong and failure to complete the decompression so you get people coming up too quickly from dives where they were supposed to do a whole lot of decompression and and what that creates is people who are very sick uh, so they mm -hmm. get very what we might call fulminant decompression sickness and so they you know in medical terms are shocked hypotensive you know their blood pressure is low they they have all sorts of biochemical and hematological derangements they might be paralyzed in all four limbs and you know just very unstable intensive care type patients and you know one i, I mean i was involved in a case well i've had a number of these over the years thankfully they're not very common mm. uh, but i do remember one in sydney a, a technical diver who uh, a good friend who came up rapidly from a 110 meter dive uh, because of a fault with a rebreather and he was incredibly sick the the sickest diver i've ever treated who actually made a full recovery and uh you know it's i can talk about it because we actually published it as a case report in diving and hyperact medicine journal because it was so interesting you know he was so sick uh, mm. and yet he actually made a full recovery you know young fit guy and had a few things line up for him he got treated very quickly uh yeah. diving off sydney and uh the the when the when the accident unfolded the rescue helicopter was actually in the air doing a a retrieval exercise and so when the guys put the phone down from ringing the ambulance service they could actually see the helicopter flying towards them you know like literally 30 seconds later so that was a very lucky break uh, in that mm -hmm. case and it turned out that at prince of wales hospital they were also running a intensive care in the hyperbaric chamber exercise <laughs> so when he, when he arrived you know like all, all these stars kind of, other than the accident happening itself obviously which we would prefer didn't occur all these yeah. stars aligned in his treatment and uh he had a terrific outcome but he was very sick are, are, are you allowed to name the guy or is he staying oh, i won't name him but uh but uh i'll certainly i can provide you a a website address where you can actually look up the paper that describes the whole case you can download it for free um Brilliant. so i'll provide that to you and if your readers want to read about that case they they can yeah i'll stick that in the show notes for sure um okay so um you're, you're kind of bridging the gap between uh, professional divers recreational divers sports divers military divers and the, uh, and the medicine world mm -hmm. um in your opinion, are we are we doing everything that's possible to promote safe diving practices, or do you think there's more that we could do? Oh, there's well, there's you, you know, it's a difficult question, but you probably can never do enough. Uh, and I I do think that the industry is reasonably good at self reflection and. Uh, making appropriate recommendations where we see problems 
Uh, now, implementing those recommendations and getting compliance with them is another challenge. But I do think that, uh, I think we're pretty good at that. I mean, we've already seen one example in this this podcast. So I talked before about how a cardiac event is the, you know, the disabling injury and 30% of diving fatalities. And the industry's response to that is to ensure that the screening questionnaire identifies those people who are at high risk of that and ensures that they have a medical evaluation before they go diving. Entirely appropriate. Mm. That's a good example of it. I mean, I've just come back from Rebreather Forum 4 in Malta, uh, where we had three days of presentations. And then at the end, I actually uh, chaired the consensus session where we pulled important points out of the um, uh, out of the various presentations that had been made and a lot of those were safety points uh, and mm. crafted them into a series of consensus statements which are effectively recommendations for industry and divers uh, and you know an example of that uh, is you know a very strong advocacy for the use of pre-jump checklists before rebreather divers jump in the water I mean it, like if if you look through at the causes of rebreather deaths, probably more than half of them have occurred because the diver jumped into the water with their oxygen cylinder turned off or their rebreather turned off or their diluent cylinder turned off or their dry suit not connected to its inflator. Just those four or five things, if everybody had checked those check and response with someone else before just before they jumped in the water it takes about 45 seconds then yeah. we probably would have had half the deaths we've had because those things are incredibly common so you know we recognize that and the industry has strongly advocated the use of pre-jump checklists very simple killer item pre-jump checklists and and there's another example of you know self-correction by the by a di diving, essentially a diving group. I mean, Rebreather Forum 4 was a collection of divers as much as anything else, but it it has self-recognized that these are issues and has advocated for an intervention, the use of checklists that will help prevent those things. So, uh, yeah. you know, I think, I think that we aren't bad at advocating for doing the right thing getting divers to do the right thing is another story of course and uh, i have no magic wand to wave in that regard matt uh, i would yeah. say this though that uh, where we want divers coming through to exhibit good practices i can't overstate the importance of people like us you and me and senior divers so people that others modify their behavior on setting a good example you know I, mm. I, and i can tell you i will not go onto a dive boat with my rebreather and not use a checklist before i get in the water but i do not want people seeing me do that and, well for a start i value my own safety you know so i don't want to make any of those mistakes but you know i just will not do that because it it's critically important um if you know if other people who are uh, you know influenceable can watch me then I want to model good behavior and I do not want to mm. set a bad example. And that's critically important in our industry. Instructors yeah. have to do the right thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's not even under the teaching umbrella either. It's it, if you are um, if you are an example of professionalism within our industry as a dive professional, you should be very vocal and very clear about doing your pre-jump checks, whether that's on a rebreather or just on a single tank recreationally. Yeah, well, you're right. You just, you know, that's right. So a buddy check, you know, and that mm. that gets omitted a lot. Um, oh, hell you yeah. Know, you all, in fact, you almost never see it done. And, mm. um, I, you know, I, I disagree with that too. I think that we should be doing those checks. Uh, mm. I cannot put my hand up and say that every time I've jumped in the water for a simple open circuit scuba dive, I always do a buddy check. And I, I should. You're quite right in, you know, taking my own previous comments on board. The reason I focused on rebreather divers in the way that I did is that we have hard evidence that those mm. things are critically important in 
causation of rebreather fatalities. There's no question about that. Slightly less of a well-proven thing for you know the efficacy of doing buddy checks. Having said that, there is no doubt that they will enhance safety and they should be done. Um, mm. uh, I, I actually I think, think we could do a better job at designing them. You know, like begin with review mm. and friend. I mean, could like an organisation like Paddy with all its resource, couldn't they come up with a better mnemonic than that? I mean, oh, we no, used to right. say we used to say botulism with runs and flatulence. I think, and <laughs> you know, we had a whole bunch. Of, like we tried to, you know, make it a bit more interesting and spicy, but. Uh, you know, surely they could do a better job. But you know what I mean. Uh, I think that those those checks are important, and we should be doing them in all forms of diving. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. I like. Um, I mean, obviously, you're going to be an advocate of him as well. But the way Gareth Locke is just um, kind of opening up that um, that kind of protection of embarrassment that people seem to feel about doing checks, and you know, just being honest and open and getting shit done. Uh, with checklists and pre-jump and honesty after a dive site with review and feedback, et cetera, et cetera. I think the more that that develops within our industry, then the safety factor is surely going to go up through the roof, in my opinion. No, no, I think that there's good evidence from other industries, uh, and aviation is a classic example, and medicine, uh, my field, is another mm. classic example where... Checklist, the use of checklists, for example, is a proven strategy for reducing mortality and complications in the operating room. Now, mm -hmm. you know, Gareth, yeah, absolutely right. You know, he he is probably the most identifiable advocate for bringing the broader field of human factors into uh, into diving, and that's not just checklists. Of course, mm -hmm. checklists is an important part of it, but anything that any strategy that will reduce the chances of errors or omissions uh, or violations where people make conscious choices to do bad things uh, is is obviously welcome. And his advocacy for uh, Talking about accidents and being open and honest about them, you know, so a just culture where people don't get judged when they do this, that's all that, that's all really important stuff. And oh yeah, another guy, I totally agree. Gareth does a great job of that. He he was at Rebreather Forum Four and spoke about mm. his passion for that over there as well. Yeah, I did see quite a few of his posts. It looks like he sat in on literally every presentation that was going on oh yeah he did well no it, well it was a single stream <laughs> meeting so you could but he didn't yeah. i didn't see him duck out of any of them <laughs> he's pretty passionate about it oh hell yeah yeah that's no, good um okay let me just flick through a couple of these questions we've got here oh i'll tell you what i didn't mention or what i'd like to touch on briefly um when we first started to chat i touched base with you because i'd um i'd had a larango spasm at 24 meters and it was not long after i'd seen stephen fordyce's presentation at, at oztech mm. um now for uh, I, well you can explain what a larango spasm is better than me surely um but if you were to uh, listeners if you were to look it up on google and just check out the videos you'll you you'll see it's a pretty horrific thing to go through, let alone be doing it underwater. Um, if you, are these pretty damn rare or is it, it kind of struck out to me that, you know, for two people to be voicing them, whether they're more common than what I thought? Yeah, uh, no, good question. Uh, so just to be clear for those listening, uh, laryngospasm is when uh, well, actually, no, let's step back and say the larynx is what a lot of people commonly refer to as the voice box. You know, so it's mm. it's this organ that sits at the top of the airway, the trachea that goes down to the lungs. Uh, and it has multiple functions. Um, it has the epiglottis, which flops down when you swallow and stops any food getting down into the airway, which you don't want. And it also contains the vocal cords, which can tighten or loosen uh, and come together or move apart in order to make the various sounds that we make when we're speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's actually a vital organ and uh, you know very important to our you know quality of life and our ability to communicate, etc. Now, 
one of the things that can occur with the larynx and the vocal cords is that if the larynx gets a lot what you might call a fright or it gets stimulated in an in a noxious way the vocal cords can snap together and that will block the airway um, and that's what we call laryngospasm and interestingly when you get uh, laryngospasm the main the, the bit of the breathing cycle so breathing cycle is inspiration and expiration the bit of the breathing cycle that gets impaired is inspiration expiration actually works because you're kind of forcing gas out through the cords from the chest whereas inspiration tends to that pushes the cords apart the vocal cords apart whereas inspiration sucks them together when you're trying to draw gas in so mm -hmm. it's inspiration that's worse and we get this thing called stridor which is when during inspiration you get this sort of either you can't inspire at all or if you can if the vocal cords are sort of very close together you get this kind of <laughs> this kind of high pitched mm -hmm. noise which I mean, if it, if it happens to you and you're awake, it's terrifying because mm. you feel like you're being strangled um, or asphyxiated, which is effectively what you are being, you know, you are being asphyxiated. It's just you hope that it's going to break before you become hypoxic and unconscious. Mm. Now, there have been, you're right. They, so there's been several episodes of this occurring underwater. And uh, to answer your original question, I, it's very rare. Um, mm. You know, I'm a diving physician, well connected in the diving medicine community and the diving community, and I've only heard of a few episodes that I think are genuine laryngospasm underwater. Um, why can it happen? I think uh, one possibility is that if you get water into your uh, airway and and you get water landing on the vocal cords, or you're unlucky enough to have a piece of a bit of snot or something get you know, land directly on the vocal cords during breathing that could precipitate laryngospasm the interesting thing about the case you mentioned uh, Stephen Fordyce's case is that that almost certainly happened because of um, negative pressure inside his airway induced by wearing a rebreather on his side a side mount rebreather and going steep vertical head down mm. to get through a passage in a cave so that the counter lung of the rebreather was w up way higher than his airway so there might I, I mean I don't know but maybe 50 60 70 centimeters of difference in water depth so the the counter lungs up here and the airways down here and that means because the two are connected to each other that meant that the pressure in the airway was the same as the pressure up here higher you know because this is shallower so mm. the the sorry the pressure in the airway is lower because the, lower. the yeah because the counter lung is shallower and that means that there's this negative pressure inside the airway which during an inspiration might be enough to suck the vocal cords together and then they'll go into spasm and that's mm. what it sounds like happened in Stephen's amazing video scary video mm. uh, and he was really lucky at, I mean it broke um, as it usually will but uh, it'd be terrifying while you're in that state of being almost unable to inhale you can exhale mm. but not inhale uh, so you breathe out and then you can't actually breathe in again so yeah That's there have it, been yeah. several cases and I think you know, there's two broad classes of cause. There's one is some kind of irritation of the vocal cords or the larynx, like water or snot or something else, or regurgitated stomach contents, something like that. And the other cause, the other potential cause, is hydrostatic imbalance, where you mm. you get this counter lung being at a very different shallower depth to your airway, and on a on a say a side mount rebreather, which can possibly do it as well but yeah fascinating yeah, yeah. yeah really interesting <clears throat> I'm really hoping Stephen will write that case up uh, and we can publish mm. it properly in in a diving medicine journal yeah yeah for sure I know we'll probably talk more about it um, he was actually the first person that I touched base with when it when it occurred because um, I mean when I heard his presentation at Oztec I'd already had a laryngospasm but it was on the surface 
it was just in between dives. I'd drunk some water, and as you say, it, I assume it was water that touched uh, the vocal cords and 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 caused. Um, and I assume underwater it was water that got on the vocal cords as well. But um, you know, seeing his video and his presentation, I'm like, holy shit, that's what it is. Because I never really took paid any attention to never it. Never figured out what it was. It was just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't bother looking into it. Um, but it was the for me, it was the the knock on effect that comes from it as well. Having that experience underwater, it was the first time, and I I won't lie, I was shitting Tiffany Cuffnakes. <laughs> I, th it was the closest and uh, the, the most understanding that I've had of panicked divers. Mm. Just having that mental uh, idea that I need to go, and I'm at 24 meters, and then the the professional side of me saying, no, don't be stupid, you've got to stay here and, and sit this out. Mm. And it only lasts about 30 seconds, but yeah. The knock-on effect was, uh, I think, probably 15 or 20 dives before I could actually comfortably be in the water again and not be thinking, shit, it's going to happen again. Mm. Oh, no, it would be yeah. terrifying. No question about mm. it. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, hyperbaric medicine. What's what do you think the the future is for it? I mean, you've obviously seen its growth over many many years now. Where are we going? Well, I think the key there is to properly research the various things that it might be useful for. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, there are a couple of indications where there are there's pretty good data from studies that show that it works so you know i mentioned diabetic foot ulcers and i mentioned radiation tissue injury but i think the key to wider acceptance for further indications in other words diseases you can treat uh, is proper research uh, you know not this oh we think it might work for this and we'll, so we'll just do it and charge people money you need to do proper trials so the future mm. is identifying things where it makes biological sense, where maybe there's been a few cases that seem to have responded well to it. So, okay, let's do a proper trial. Let's prove this and therefore gain wider acceptance amongst you know the medical community that this is a legitimate indication. That's the future. Now, mm. whether we get there or not, because we haven't done a terrific job of that so far, I mean, follow the money. That's the problem. You know, people just mm. want to make money. So they're looking for things that they can charge money for and that they can treat now. And there doesn't seem to be any shortage of people prepared to pay money for treatment for things where it hasn't got adequate proof. But the future, mm. if I could wave a magic wand, the future would be proper trials in a, in a relatively limited number of conditions. Um, where uh, it, it might work and establish those things as either established indications or not. Uh, yep, good evidence or not. That's what we need. Mm. Uh, mm. You know, the situation we have right now, I mean, the getting back to the point I made before, if every diabetic foot ulcer and every radiation tissue injury in Auckland that actually could benefit from hyperbaric oxygen got referred, it would keep two or three hyperbaric units busy full time, you know, 24 seven. You don't need anything else actually. The problem is those patients aren't getting referred. And the reason they're not getting referred is all this bollocks activity by people who drag the reputation of the field down. And so the physicians looking after these patients think, oh no, I'm not gonna refer them for that because it's, you know, here's this advertisement for treating everything under the sun with hyperbaric oxygen, it must be bollocks. That's the point. If we stuck to a, an evidence base, you know, ethical practice, then we would get all the referrals you could possibly need to make your, you know, your hyperbaric unit successful. But unfortunately, yeah. we're in this kind of vicious circle where there's too much unestablished practice out there and that creates a poor reputation for the field. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, well, how about we bring it up the other way? What's um, What's been some of the most rewarding aspects of the work that you've done over your years? Well, uh, in, in terms of diving, uh, you know, in recent years I've become, you know, I've been a technical diver, well, recent years, the last, 
since I left the, left the Navy 30 years ago, um, I've been involved in technical diving, and since 2000, well, 1998 or 99, I've been a rebreather diver. Uh, and you know, I've had the most amazing experiences as a as a diver. You know, I, I could there's too many to kind of to um, articulate, but I I would say that probably the single most rewarding thing for me in diving was way back in 20 two, sorry 2002 when Trevor Jackson and I dived the wreck that was thought to be Australian hospital ship Centaur off Brisbane. It was 180 metres, no one had ever dived it, and uh, at the time, actually, it was the deepest shipwreck dive that had ever been done. And um, we dived it because we'd obtained some video from when that ship had been discovered 10 years earlier that we thought made it look possible that it actually wasn't the right wreck. And yet this was gazetted on the government website as on charts as the Centaur. There was a church on the nearest point of land. There were trips out there uh, for families to throw wreaths over the side on that site. And, and here we were thinking, mm, maybe it's not even the right ship. So we dived it uh, and indeed found that it wasn't the right ship, which created quite a lot of controversy at the time. Um, 60 Minutes made a program about our dive uh, where they essentially shamed the government for accepting the report from 10 years earlier. That was done with an ROV. So someone went, put an ROV down, got some sort of vague, oh, it's a shipwreck. They claimed it was the Centaur and no one really questioned that. And yet, you know, 10 years later, we dived, it's not the right wreck. And, and it was a bit unsatisfying because, you know, we disenfranchised all these people who thought they knew where their loved ones were. But the good thing that came out of that was the Australian government funded a search for the real uh, wreck. And that, it, they actually chartered the ship that found the Bismarck in the Atlantic and HMAS Sydney off uh, Western Australia. And they found it about five miles or so further out than we were. We were right on the edge of the continental shelf. They found it in 2,000 metres of water, never be dived. Um, no question, they found it with the bell on deck, HMA, uh, uh, AHS Centaur, you know, the whole biz it was extraordinary. And mm. the cool thing about that is that, you know, after a few years, these people who were throwing wreaths on the wrong wreck got taken out there for the very first time and threw wreaths over the side on the right side. And look, you know, if I was visiting a, a, a grave site for my grandfather in France who died in the war and his body was really at another grave site, I'd actually want to know that, you know? And yeah. so in the end, it had a good outcome. Uh, and that probably the single most satisfying thing I've ever done in diving was that dive. But I've had lots of amazing experiences. And just, you know, mm. recently I've been doing you know, expeditions with the wet mules guys um, here in New Zealand, the Pierce Resurgence Cave. We went there in 2020. Uh, Richard Harris and Craig Challen did, uh, uh, you know, extended their previous range in that cave. They did 245 metres uh, <laughs> and a 16 hour dive in six degree water. And just several months ago, Richard and Craig did another dive, this time slightly less 230 but used hydrogen for the very first time in 30 years very right. first time ever in a rebreather uh to um try and ameliorate the effects of the high pressure neurological syndrome while getting rid of the nitrogen out of the mix because of its density uh, and that was successful so that was another really satisfying expedition to be part of um yeah and that was just just a couple of months ago so you know i've had some fabulous yeah. uh fabulous times in diving um yeah and in terms of i think you also asked about you know professionally uh well we you know we've kind of over the last 20 years or yeah the 20 years we, we've sort of made an art form out of identifying problems or questions that the diving community has in relation to diving medicine or physiology particularly around the use of rebreathers and trying to answer those questions with relatively simple small studies that are doable but are of high practical relevance and we've had a terrific time with that just lots of mm. uh, really interesting studies 
Uh, probably my single, like if you're asking me, my single biggest contributor to diving medicine, in my view, would be the consensus conference that we held in 2004 in Sydney, where we developed an international consensus on what mild decompression sickness is and uh, an acceptance that it's okay to not recompress patients with mild decompression sickness if it's difficult to access mm. recompression. Uh, and that, why is that important? It's important because that was the dawn of the age of travel to all these exotic locations that we're currently seeing. You know, people going, people were wanting, you know, the the most remote, the most exotic, the you know, the 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 new experience. And so they were going to increasingly remote locations all over the world. And it was creating problems because they would ring Dan with these very mild, non-specific symptoms from places like Bikini Atoll. And then you're faced with this issue, well, what do we do? Because at that point in time, it was pretty much a standard of care. If someone had symptoms of decompression sickness and you made the diagnosis, you kind of were obligated to evacuate them, no matter how serious or not it was. Whereas once we'd, once we'd constructed this consensus and we had uh, an agreement on that, it, it really revolutionized the way divers were managed all over the world. And look, we, you know, we're 20 years, almost 20 years down the track from that consensus. And although it was very controversial at the time, um, I, it's fair to say that no evidence or even compelling anecdote has emerged that would suggest we went too far with that, that mm. it, it seems to have worked. Uh, and that was a big contribution to the way divers are managed all, all over the world uh, that has persisted and, you know, become relatively entrenched in practice, I would say. So, you know, those mm. are a couple of examples of really satisfying things that I've had in my career. Yeah, just a, just a couple of good ones, eh? Oh, well, well, you know, like it all sounds a bit sort of self-congratulatory. I mean, you, you asked, so I'm, I'm yeah, telling you. Yeah, it should uh, be. But, uh, um, yeah, I'm, look, lots, every diver's got their best dive, you know, so mm. mine just happened to be the centaur thing. Um, well, I won't say it was my best dive, but it was certainly the most satisfying dive project I've been involved with. But, the, you know, these recent yeah. things with the wet meals have been terrific as well, I, I must say. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, uh, uh, what I want to pick up on there as well, um, just on the subject, what's your thoughts on, on people doing the old-fashioned kind of self-administered recompression? You mean in suspect? the water? Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, that is an issue that's been around for a long time. Uh, it's been mm. a big controversy. Typically, the medical community have been against it. However, uh, again, this is another thing that the the growth, the ad advent of technical diving has changed that lam landscape a bit. So uh, just a few years ago, 2018, um, I was actually asked by the Divers Alert Network in the US to review pre-hospital management of decompression sickness, which included that mild definition, you know, revisiting that, has it worked, do we need to change it? And, and one of the questions they asked was, well, what about in-water recompression? Because the medical community considered it quite a few times and said, no, 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 we don't want that. Um, and yet now we have this population of technical divers who are trained to plan and execute decompression stops in the water. They're trained to use 100% oxygen in the water. They know the risks of doing that they know how to minimize those risks they know how to do it safely in other words is this a group that we would be prepared to endorse using in water recompression under certain circumstances and to cut a long story short uh, the consensus we came to is yes so there is now a consensus of medical experts that says that properly selected divers with decompression sickness being treated by properly trained and equipped divers, and that is technical divers trained to at least decompression procedures level, so they mm -hmm. know how to use oxygen, can use in-water recompression legitimately if a hyperbaric chamber is more than two hours away. 
Okay. So that's kind of where we've landed in terms of in-water recompression. So it's not, so let me be clear, it's not that every paddy dive master can put a sign on their boat saying in-water recompression provided here. You know, that is not the intent of it. And it's not yeah. in-water recompression on air because that has been shown under multiple you know, conditions to not be very successful. But mm. in-water recompression by properly trained divers using oxygen uh, is definitely an option. And once again, uh, I can provide you with a web link uh, to a paper, that the paper that we uh, essentially generated to justify th that decision. One of the things we did is quite interesting, it was part of, part of that process. We dug out all the evidence that demonstrates that very, very, very rapid recompression is effective. Because that's the big advantage that in-water recompression gives you, right? It's you can yeah. do it really quickly. And and in fact, we found data from US Navy databases that David Dillett has access to. We, we were able to present a strong case that very rapid recompression does actually work. So that's point number one. And also we demonstrated, we found data from early US Navy recompression table testing programs that shorter, shallower recompressions like you can do in water actually are effective, especially if you use them early. You can't do a table six in the water, right? You can't go mm. to 2.8 atmospheres underwater and breathe 100% oxygen. That's too dangerous. Yeah. But you can go to 1.9 meters and there are some in-water recompression treatment protocols that basically involve that, especially if you use mm -hmm. a full face mask or a mouthpiece retainer device as a safety factor. Um, I'm just going to have to plug my computer in here because uh, I think I'm going to run out of power soon uh, if I'm not oh, careful. Right. Uh, I think we're all good. Yeah. And I have power. So, uh, no, that's that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, you'll just have to edit that bit out. Yeah. That's fine. I might leave it in just for embarrassment factor of not plugging <laughs> the computer in. <laughs> okay, I tell you what, let's do um let's do another nine questions of the ten questions I've been asking every guest. We've just had one of those because one of the questions was a memorable dive and I think 180 meters kind of covers that. Um and then we can get wrapped up and you can get on with your your merry day. Sure. Um, okay, so question number one. How do you describe your position as a diver and um, medical guru to people who are not familiar with the activity of diving? Well, I would just say that I, I am a diver, uh, you know, and like any person who's been passionate in a sport for a long time, I've evolved over a long period of time. And so as a diver, I'm now what people call a technical diver and I use rebreathers for deeper, longer dives. That just gets mm. me to places where I couldn't get to otherwise. I'm not a depth snob, by the way. I, you know, I'm still happy <laughs> to go for a nice shallow tropical reef dive. I love it, in fact. But the technical diving is a tool to get longer and deeper. And I've been mm. very lucky to be able to wrap that passion up into my career, both as a clinician in treating other divers who are sick, but also in doing research work to answer questions that are relevant to the communities that I'm part of. So I've had a very all-encompassing diving and medical career all wrapped together, both clinically, academically, and recreationally. I, mm. I don't know if that answers that question, but that's, yeah, that's my, that's my answer. <laughs> well, you, you've actually fit in a hell of a lot into what you could arguably say is a relatively short time over your lifespan. You know, to, to be able to do and achieve what you've done so far is just phenomenal. Oh, well, that's very nice of you. I, I mean, I, it's like a long, slow innings in cricket. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Accumulate runs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, one thing I didn't ask, and I should, um, it, it, it crossed my mind when I was speaking to Pete the other week. Um, with the advent of a lot more um, tech divers, effectively recreational tech divers that are going on holidays to these remote locations and whatnot. Um, do you think there's going to be um, an increase in issues with, um, you know, decompression uh, sickness uh, due to these people being qualified and then um, not, 
not preparing for such a trip like Chuck Lagoon or something like that. You know, I can only imagine people sitting at home for a long period of time, not really doing dives to what you would call reasonable depths. And then all of a sudden going doing 10, 12, 15 days on a boat diving every day. Yeah. Surely that's got to increase their problems. I, I think possibly. I, I'm not sure that it's the lack of preparation, although that, you know, could certainly contribute. It's not really mm. what we see. What, what we see on those expeditions, and I, you know, I've been on maybe six or seven of Pete's expeditions to either truck or bikini, actually more than that. And I'm going mm. again in December too. Uh, what we see is divers who, it doesn't really matter whether they're active prior or not, um, they get to a place like that and they're just blown away by how good it is. And because it's trip of a lifetime, I've spent a fortune getting there, they just want to squeeze out every single diving minute that they can. And so mm. we see them doing patterns of diving that they probably wouldn't do, like, you know, two big dives a day, um, you know, decompression dives, long, deepish. Uh, and then it's usually day three or four we start to see problems, you know, as this all accumulates. So it's not really the fact that they haven't prepared necessarily, rather that they just get to an amazing place and, you know, dive their backsides off. And, and that just creates provocation. Um, mm -hmm. That's the main issue, I think, is it's not like I don't think it would have helped if you'd done a whole lot of diving before you arrived. I think you'd still be likely to have the same kind of problems it's just this mm. you know arrive in this amazing place and then just go ballistic with the go diving mental. yeah that's what yeah, that's typically yeah. what we see yeah fair one okay mm. all right so um if someone wanted to pursue a career similar to yours what advice would you give them uh well uh, there are quite a few people who are doing exactly that and i get to talk to them quite often. I've got a young medical student from the United States staying at our home at the moment who's who's trying to do exactly what I've done. Well, I, you know, be a diver, uh, but then there's some hard yards that have to be done. And one of them mm. is getting a medical degree. It, you know, if you really want to be a diving, an academic diving physician, so getting a medical degree. And, uh, and then one of the pieces of advice that I quite often give to circumvent people trying to do what I did, which was make it all about diving medicine, is that you can't do that, right? You, right. you, there's no such thing as someone who only does diving medicine. It, there's just nowhere where you see enough divers to do that. Well, well, there are some people who spend their entire lives doing diving medicals, but sorry, I'd rather rip my own head off than, than do, <laughs> like, you know, you're just doing these endless medicals on people who are fit and well. That's yeah. not my idea of, of satisfaction. So what I mean, what you need to do is do your medical degree and then involve yourself in the activities of a diving medicine unit. So as an on-call doctor and contribute to an on-call roster, but at the same time, you need to train in another specialty that will pay the bills and hopefully have some compatible skills that, you know, you can apply in your diving medicine career. So anesthesiology is absolutely perfect. You know, we, mm. we, we become very good at managing critically ill people. Uh, we've got great airway skills. We know all there is to know about giving drugs that sustain life. Uh, and... And so anesthesia is a great choice. And also there's quite a lot of cross fertilization between diving medicine physiology and anesthesia physiology, you know, gas physiology, all that kind of stuff. But emergency medicine is another good one. Um, and oh, look, any medical specialty would do, but the ones that give you a skill mix which translates in some practical way to diving medicine, like out there in the field, when I'm on one of Pete's expeditions, the fact that someone could come to the surface and be drowned and need resuscitation, as an anesthesiologist, that doesn't phase me too much. That's not to say I wouldn't get mm. distressed in a situation like that. Of course I would, especially if the patient's doing badly. But but I know I've got the right set of skills to deal with a thing like that. Whereas if I was a dermatologist, maybe less so. You yeah. get my point. So yeah. go to med school, maintain your interest in diving, do a compatible specialty, 
do it in a place where there is a diving medicine unit so that you can get involved in the activities of that unit. And then you have this parallel career going forward in your primary medical specialty and diving medicine. And that, and of course, stay a diver and keep diving. That's how to do it. And if you really want to immerse yourself and become influential, then getting involved in diving medicine research is also a good thing to do. Because the truth of it is, um, people don't know me because I'm good at treating decompression sickness. They know me because I've published a lot of stuff about diving and diving medicine and diving physiology. And a lot of that comes out of the research that I do. So if you really want to become influential and talk at a lot of conferences and all that kind of stuff, you need to start studying diving and diving medicine and that's mm, a cool thing to mm. do too you know and I you know I was very lucky I got to do a PhD in a, a relevant subject area when I was in the Navy there are other ways of doing that but um, yeah so go to med school do a relevant specialty in parallel with some diving medicine activity and so if you're doing if you want to do this in New Zealand you'd either do it in Auckland or Christchurch where there are chambers you wouldn't yeah. do it in Wellington, for example, because that you wouldn't be able to immerse yourself in the activities of a diving medicine unit. Um, yeah. And stay a diver, advance your diving career, and do some research. That, there you go. Mm. There's my formula for becoming someone Good like idea. me. Um, if you could change anything about the diving industry or scuba diving in general, what would it be? Uh, I'd probably... It probably goes back to that discussion we had earlier about human factors I, I mean because my natural gravitation is towards safety you know because of my role as a physician and and the things that motivate me or that I would want to change are the things that promote safety I mean if I was a eco warrior I might give you a completely different answer to that question quite legitimately you know but for me in with my professional interests um, you know, if I could wave a magic wand and get every rebreather diver to use a checklist, that would be something before they jump in the water. That's probably something I would do. Um, mm. So it, uh, it's difficult to put my finger on any one thing, but I think uh, there's an whoops, there's an example if you want one of something that would fit that sort of question. Okay, um, thinking about uh, green and conservation, what um, what are your thoughts on ways for us as human beings to minimize our impact on the oceans? Uh, well, there's lots of ways, of course, but for me, there's two broad areas. One is you know, pollution of the oceans and plastics in particular. And actually, mm. you know, we're, we're moving in the right direction there, I think, you know, that if you think about the change in plastics use that, you know, you and I have witnessed in the last, 10 years there's definitely been a change and people are mm. onto that but pollution of the oceans is a big one but the other thing that i think is is um it, like it's this is the big thing is exploitation i, I mean we are yeah. overfishing the oceans there is absolutely no doubt about that and you only have to look at places where you explicitly prevent that from happening to see what things could be like if we didn't do that. Now, look, mm. I get it. I mean, you know, people rely on the oceans for food, but some of the things we see and the exploitation that goes on, it just can't go on. I mean, we need to button off on that. We need to find better ways, less damaging ways of feeding the population of the world than strip mining it of all life. And and things that really offend me are these, you know, pictures of dead manta rays with their gills ripped out or sharks with their fins chopped off or, you know, like mm. if I could put a stop to that kind of stuff, but just at a high level, reducing exploitations to sustain exploitation to fishing pressure to sustainable levels which currently we're not doing you know there yeah. are places where we do but um and isolated fisheries which are exemplars of how things can be done but across the world we're not doing a very good job of it and yeah, that I needs agree. to change agreed agreed 
Um, well, seeing as we're on the conservation bandwagon, is there um, is there any kind of conservation efforts that you're particularly passionate about? And uh, if so, why? Uh, um well, lots of, I mean, lots, you know, there's no mm. sensible conservation effort that I wouldn't, um, that I wouldn't support. But I guess, I guess one that springs to mind as a diver, uh, because it's diving oriented is, and I think there are branches of this in lots of different countries, but here in New Zealand, we've got a group that, um, that focus particularly on ghost net fishing. Uh, yeah. and and getting rid of ghost nets out of the ocean uh, and I I am like there's nothing more heartbreaking than seeing a, a net sitting somewhere that's caught a whole lot of things in it that aren't ever going to be used for food and mm. they're not species of fish sometimes it's birds sometimes it's marine mammals that you know no one wants to catch anyway I mean nets are a very unselective way of catching fish um, but getting rid mm. of those ghost nets there's a couple of groups well there's one group here in New Zealand that is very active in that regard and I you know I really admire them because they put a huge amount of time and effort into it and it's you know such a cool thing to do it's not it's not going to solve the world's fishing problems but I as a focused project I think it's a super cool thing yeah yeah no good on you yeah we've got a few ghost nets over here in Australia as well mm -hmm. funded by the government I think they call them shark nets shark nets yeah <laughs> Yeah. Uh, mm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Has your passion for diving or the industry itself changed over time? And if so, how? Well, uh, the passion's never changed really, but certainly the nature of the activities I've done. And it's, like I said earlier, it's one of the super cool things about diving is you can reinvent yourself as a diver multiple times mm. throughout a long career indeed you kind of need to otherwise things just get a bit routine but i've like i said you know i've cycled through snorkeling spear fishing this is an approximate chronological order scuba diving instruction military diving rebreathers mixed gas diving photography you know it it just it, it's been a, a fantastic evolution and sometimes I've ducked in and out of those different things over the course of the year. So it's a, it is an activity where you can do lots of different stuff. Um, the passion levels might stay the same throughout the whole time, but you can certainly change what you do and the emphasis mm. on your activities. Um, the industry, well, I, I guess the emergence of technical diving as a something that non-military non-occupational people can do has been a real revolution and some of the achievements of uh you know my technical diving colleagues are just extraordinary um i mean it has its risks but uh i think it's i think that, that is a a very important evolution in the industry yeah i can't imagine what it's going to be like in a couple of hundred years well, who would know? Uh, yeah. You know, one atmosphere diving suits that you can go to a thousand feet in and not have any decompression. You know, who knows? We're not yeah. that far away yeah. from that now. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I agree. Now, here's a difficult question for you. Probably the most difficult question you've ever answered. Um, what are your top five bucket list diving destinations? Uh, well, of course, some of them I've already ticked off. If, if you'd asked me what my bucket list was, you know, years ago, um, I, uh, you know, I would have included places like Bikini and Truck, but, and there are two places that I've been to multiple times now, um, mm -hmm. and never get tired of them. Uh, but if you're talking about places I've never dived, you know, because there are some extraordinary places here in Australia, and, and sorry, here in New Zealand and Australia that I've dived. Mm. But no, if you're talking about places I've yet to dive, uh, there's a few. Um, I'd really like to go to the Galapagos. I've never done that. Uh, and yeah, I, I just, I think that that's definitely a bucket list location. Um, yeah. I would like to, um, I'd like to dive the caves in Florida. That would be another bucket list in Mexico. Now I actually have, done a little bit of cavern diving in Mexico but I've never done the you know the big time cave so there's mm -hmm. three um I'd also really like to 
you, you notice the pattern here is that they're all places that are quite weird uh, in their own ways. But um, I quite like to go into the northern. I've dived Antarctica, but I'd really like to go and dive, do some cold water diving, <clears throat> perhaps ice diving up in Norway or, you know, the polar, the North Polar ice cap somewhere. That would be an amazing thing. Do you get different creatures up there? Um, yeah. And I mean, that's probably five. Uh, you know, as a passionate diver, I don't, I'm, I'm actually pretty cool with just diving anywhere. There's fascination to find mm. wherever you jump in the water. Um, but yeah, those are, there's some ideas about places I'd love to go. Yeah. So it's creatures as well. Then it's, um, you know, you mentioned the Galapagos, and you, you've got to go get it, get on one of Pete's trips or whatever. I'm, I'm going at the end of July. Mm. Yeah, July. I've got an expedition going, um, and it's just, it's sensational and. If you're in at the big critters, oh boy, they get big and, and plentiful down there, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll certainly take that advice. <laughs> and take a, take a lot of SD cards with you because you're going to go through <laughs> quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, um, how would you describe the dive community to a non-diver? Oh, um, <clears throat> it's a varied community. I, it's like... I think lots of different people. One of one of the one of different types of people. One of the things I often say to prospective divers is that it's a great activity for families and it's a great activity for women, which sounds a bit kind of like off in this modern day and age. But you know, sometimes these things need to be said. And partly the reason I say that is that women actually you know, objectively make better divers than men, um, mm. probably because they're more sensible and not driven by, you know, the desire to strip as much biomass from the marine environment as possible every time they jump in the water. So, I, I mean, I think, I think it's a great gender balanced activity, although there are more men than women in the sport. Um, I think the community consists of lots of individuals doing their own thing, but it also consists of focused groups who identify as groups. And actually, if what you're looking for is a sense of belonging or camaraderie, there's lots of that in diving if you want it, you know, so especially in technical diving, there's lots of groups in various places that identify as sort of projects or communities that do a lot of diving together and organize things together. So I th I think it's uh, it, it generally is populated by nice people. Um, there are some big egos. <laughs> there are some big egos, of course. Uh, Rebreather four and four. I mean, that was like three hundred of the biggest egos in the world all crammed into <laughs> one room. But but actually, you know, they all played nicely. And I I think uh, I, I think it's gen generally you you know you go to a meeting like Oztech or something like that, and the vibe you get is pretty warm and co collegial mm. you know i think i and i actually think it's involved in that way when i first got into diving there was a lot of um uh you know cliqueiness to it um and um people who considered themselves sort of above everybody else but i think that's all sort of wear, worn off and basically it's a nice community yeah, yeah sorry a bit yeah. of a long-winded answer but uh, yeah no, it's Difficult a question. brilliant answer. This is this is why I ask these questions, these ten questions to every guest that comes on, because um, albeit you know some answers are very long, some are very short, but they're all coming to the same thing. Especially that one, mm. you know. It's um, I think for for me, it's it it's a uh, it's the closest thing when it comes to camaraderie that I've ever experienced outside of the military. Mm. Uh, and I, quite frankly, I fucking love it. Mm. It's great. Mm. Yeah. Um, last one, and I think I know the answer to this one. Of the many safety procedures we have in the industry, if you had to choose one as the most important, what would it be? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, we've had this discussion. Uh, it, it, in terms of bang for your buck, in terms of objective evidence that it would result in less deaths, without question, it would be pre-jump checklists for rebreather divers. There's no... no it, 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 it's easy. That's an easy question to answer. 
yeah. and, and we know this from parallel fields and in fact some research in diving too you know the, the dan group published a really big study looking at the efficacy of pre-dive checklists not pre-jump checklists specifically but it did reduce critical events in the water it's a, a very underrated study in fact but we know from aviation and medicine that you know short killer item checklists will prevent bad things from happening and there's no yeah. question we know that these bad things happen in rebreather divers and checklists could prevent them if people did them so yep yeah. that's it easy answer done yeah. get them done <laughs> Happy days. Yeah. Um, Simon, let's wrap this bad boy up and, and get, get on with the, the weekend ahead. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for your time and coming on the show. Ladies and gents, thanks for listening in. And all of the details that we've been talking about will be in the show notes. And uh, see you all soon. Bye for now. Scuba Goat Under the Sea, the podcast for the inquisitive diver.